Now, moving beyond the debate around Russia, Ukraine and the spillover effects at the United Nations General Assembly, and to another subject that I feel very passionately about, and that's progress on financial inclusion and improving in financial literacy around the world. This has been the mission of the United Nations Secretary General's Special Advocate for Inclusive Finance for over a decade. Her Majesty Queen Maxima of the Netherlands is a proponent for universal access to affordable, effective and safe financial services and how to get there. And while the pandemic has left dark clouds over many economies, perhaps one of the silver linings has been a dramatic rise in digital payments and greater access to basics like bank accounts, as we discussed. Well, first of all, thank you for having us, and uh, not me in particular, but for the whole issue on the subject of financial inclusion, which is really so important for so many people around the world, even here in the United States. So when I started my job around 2011, we were actually having something like 50% of the world population were financially included. What do we mean by that? They actually have an access to having a bank account in which they can get payments, make savings, borrow, invest in opportunities, get an insurance in case there's a risk. Um, but that was not possible for many, many people, as you know. And now the last figures actually show 76%. So in 10 years, we actually got a quarter of the world population to actually have access to financial services and actually more and more use them. So this is really a big success, extremely happy. So you also track resilience and the number of people that actually in an emergency can't get access to financial resources within a 30-day window and I believe it's 55 percent around 55 yeah. percent of people are still struggling in certain parts of the world and, and that's a problem even if you have the financial tools if you don't have the financial resources you can't access them. Yeah. So um, financial inclusion is a means to an end. It's not an end in itself. So in the end of the day, you don't become better by being financially included. What you want is a financial health right. that actually through these tools, people can actually have better uh, ways of actually being able to affront the day to day expenses they actually have and responsibilities, being able to invest in the future, being able to affront a shock when you know something like climate change happens or you know your husband dies and you know you, you have to sort of you know some three years until you get a job being able to have some savings to be able to you know pay for the food of your kids and the school of your kids and not having financial stress which is also a very big issue so these four points are actually very important on the financial health perspective and yes we have been trying to uh, um, track that you know recently and we're going to continue to track that to see and monitor how that actually develops and what are the types of products and services that we have to develop going forward to help these four issues? Because it's very nice to actually have somebody financially included, but if it's not actually leading to better lives, then what is the point? I've been watching very closely some of the work that you've been doing in Senegal, and it was, I believe, female farmers, um, a product called My Agro, and to your point, the, the challenge of managing things like climate change at a time when you're also trying to manage finances, higher fertilizer prices. Talk to me about some of those female farmers that you met. So, you know, first of all, I was so happy to be there because <laughs> in the end of the day, I've been doing so much work, you know, during COVID, but it was all through a Zoom, <laughs> and you do not really get the feeling of it. I'm finally seeing the clients because that's the reason I'm actually doing yeah, all this work for and uh, there are many examples I saw but one of them yes was this my agro and um, basically these women can actually sort of do little investments uh, uh, savings through their mobile phones which is only allowed to do through the mobile phones and by the way by the time they actually get some investment the, the savings they can actually invest in better seeds better irrigation therefore the yields go up the income goes up and if there's a drought or too much rain they know how to deal with it so extremely important for all these women that actually are, you know, 50 percent, they are the smaller farmers in Africa. And this type of issue, so financial inclusion and this whole resilience on the whole financial inclusion is so important because if we look at the farmers in Africa, we need to increase the yield. That's where the poor people are. Yeah. But not only that, if, we want, if Africa wants to be less uh, import dependent, they will have to invest in the farmers all around. The, you know what we've actually seen with the war and the imports and the, the mm. basic the dependence on imports they actually had for food. Well, 
we need to invest in the African food production. And that means not only small farmers, the whole value chain needs to be digitized. The whole value chain needs to be in a system in which you, know, you can actually assure that actually the whole system becomes much more productive. And that is investing also in financial inclusion and insurance and ways of actually access to markets. And that's what digitization has, a fantastic opportunity. Another example is in the Ivory Coast. I know you were there looking at cashewnut farmers as well and having yeah. a platform where they can track exports and understand what their business looks like too. To the same point, it's all about building resilience and it's actually you going there and meeting these people and understanding exactly what they need. Yeah, and showing examples to leaders and private sector right. that you know these systems can work and what a potential it actually has. You do have to invest in distribution. How It's, it's a different mindset. But how do I actually get everybody in, giving them the right inputs so that I can and actually give them the right access to markets so the whole value chain is actually you know, be much, much stronger and, 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 you know, at the end of the day, increase the livelihoods of these people and at the same time, macroeconomically, uh, really help the countries as well. While we're in, and while I have you in the United States, as you were pointing out, and as I'm very aware as well, I think we had 40% of Americans that couldn't write a $500 check coming into the pandemic. So when you talk about financial literacy, financial health, we can emphasize the point that this is not just a developing market issue, it's a developed market issue too. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, uh, we know the OECD respondents, 50% said they had no money left at the end of the month. So this is a very big issue. Even in the Netherlands, mm. you know, we have, uh, you know, six, six, this is before the whole inflation started, 600,000 households with, you know, problematic debts and now 1.4 million households in, in, in situational stress in some way. This is going to become only sort of worse with inflation. So mm. we really need to look at this point. So uh, we are working, at least in the Netherlands, we are working in not only in how to help them budget and, you know, getting out of debts and also getting out the taboos because it takes five years for a family in the Netherlands to actually ask for help when they're in situations of debt. Wow. Five years, because they think they can do it together. They don't want to be dependent. They want to be independent. And so it takes them five years. And it, you know, it's a pity because how they actually help as for help before, the amount of debt would have been much less. So yeah. we're trying to do these things in another. It is a very difficult moment geopolitically. It's a difficult moment for, for individuals, as you mentioned, within the inflation crisis and the challenges too. Are there reasons for hope, though? based on what we were discussing about the, the, the efforts that have been made and the individual stories that you've seen? Well, I think that um, the digital part has actually given a lot, uh, people a lot of empowerment, yeah. getting access to information, getting access to services. But then we have to make sure that this is actually in a sustainable, safe and competitive way. What do I mean by that? So one thing that I've been fighting for is the issue of digital public goods. If you don't have connectivity, then the poor people are not going to have sort of access to it. If they don't have a, an ID and a digital ID, they cannot open an account. Mm. If we don't have interoperable payment systems, it's not going to be a competitive system that really is going to help them. If we don't have cybersecurity issues, then, you know, may actually fall into, you know, losing their money. If we don't have some kind of digital literacy, which I also find as part of digital public goods, people are not going to be able to really reap all the benefits from the, that digitization. So, we need to have a better focus on the digital public goods in every country and infrastructure that needs to be in place so that people really, this big opportunity that's being given by digital you know, life and infrastructure, that we can actually reap the benefits and everybody reap the benefits. So you're just getting started. That's the message. Well, no, I think a lot of work is, needs to be done. And, and I think that it's very important that we actually talk about these issues. Yeah, I agree. Queen Maxima, thank you so much. Thank you so thank much. Thank you.